Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tom Thompson, and I'm the executive director of the Chatham County Savannah Metropolitan Planning Commission. And the Planning Commission, uh, who serves as staff to the Chatham County Resource Protection Commission, are proud to host Perspectives in Archaeology, Digging for the Truth, a panel discussion this afternoon. I'm going to do just a few introductory remarks. I just want to start by um, saying, how many of you ever have ever dug some up in your backyard and found, say, an old glass bottle? And anybody do that? When I was a kid, we did that in our neighborhood and found all sorts of things like that. And you look at it, and it's some, you know, off-colored, heavy glass, and you say, I wonder what this was. Well, Savannah obviously has a lot of rich history in its past, but when we dig uh, in Savannah, and we do a lot of digging with development and public projects, uh, I'm not sure that we have in place uh, anyone who's going to ask when they find something, you know, what is this and how does it relate to our, our history and maybe our future. So we're here today to explore uh, some of that with our panelists. Uh, before we get going, I'd like to recognize a few folks in the audience. Um, I saw Alderwoman Sprague uh, come in. Uh, thank you very much for attending. Uh, Bob Sebeck from the county. Uh, Glenda Anderson, former city, I guess, about now retired, but uh, in the archives, and her replacement, uh, Luciana Spraker. Where, where is she hiding? There she is, okay. Um, and um, Daniel Carey, Historic Savannah Foundation, thank you. Come in from your run this afternoon. <laughs> At least one of us does something, right? I did the lawn this morning. <laughs> and any other members of the uh, Resource Protection Commission? I know we have one member of the, uh, oh, okay, hello. Um, okay, thank you for being here. And I see Dave, Dave Rossell's in the back and he's a member of the Chatham County uh, Historic Preservation Commission. So again, welcome and thank you. And thank you, thank you to our sponsors. I'm sure Ellen will cover that in more detail. Um, the MPC, through the Resource Protection Commission, is looking into the feasibility of a, a creating an archaeological program for Chatham County and Savannah. And I'll let Ellen talk about that a little bit more. This panel discussion is the first step in opening a dialogue with our community about the ideas and about how we could possibly do this. Uh, thank you for coming on a beautiful Saturday afternoon and being part of this uh, presentation. We hope you um, enjoy this and, and afterwards you might have an opportunity to come up and speak directly with some of our panelists. Ellen? I'll be careful. Uh, good afternoon, and um, thank you again for, for coming out on this beautiful, beautiful day. Um, I'd like to first recognize and say thank you to our sponsors and partnerships in this endeavor. Um, this was, um, uh, uh, took a lot of organization and, um, and some funding and uh, help to put, put this together. So first I'd like to thank our reception sponsors, uh, the Lamar Institute, Dan and Rita Elliott, thank you, um, as well as Coastal Heritage Society. Scott Smith, thank you very much for uh, your contributions there. Um, as I mentioned, we had a lot of partners putting this together, the Metropolitan Planning Commission, the Resource Protection Commission, uh, Chatham County, the City of Savannah, the County Historic Preservation Commission, the City's uh, Historic District Board of Review, the Georgia Trust for Historic Preservation, and the Coastal Georgia Archaeological Society. I also like to say, say a special thank you to um, Pastor Enoch Hendry and uh, Trinity Church to allow us to uh, have this discussion in this, in this beautifully restored sanctuary. So thank you all for that. We have additional support that I'd like to say thank you for from Cosmos Mariner Productions, who's handling the, the filming of the panel discussion today, Savannah Cooks, Brian Graves, who is the caterer for our reception afterwards. Um, audiovisual repairs, who's handling the uh, AV equipment rental and microphones, et cetera, for today. 
and SCAD Historic Preservation graduate students who volunteered uh, in, in the middle of this um, a very busy time in the quarter to, to help today. Barbara Fisher, Candice Lighty, Simone Morris, and Kate Stevens. So uh, thank, thank all of you um, for, for your help today in pulling this together. Um, I just wanted to share a few personal thoughts that, that I've had um, about archaeology uh, with you. Um, and sort of my journey and exploration to, to, to learning more about this. I am not an archaeologist, and my background is not in archaeology. I, um, I am, my, my background uh, is really as a historian. I um, originally went to school and got an undergraduate degree in medieval history. And when I graduated, I realized I probably should have paid a little more attention to my dad, who said, you need to pick something that's a little bit more employable than medieval history. <laughs> that led me to uh, looking at historic preservation as a, as a um, sort of hands-on application of history, and, um, and, and that, that's what led me to historic preservation. Historic preservation, though, really focuses on the built environment, and the focus is, is uh, mostly on buildings. And I always had an appreciation for archaeology, but I always had in the back of my mind, never really at the forefront of my thoughts, uh, felt like it was almost ancillary to historic preservation. The buildings tell the real story. The buildings are what import, what's important. What you find in the ground may complement that, but you know, if the buildings are there, that's, that's what's really important. And as I've talked with folks and gone to lectures and learned more about it, I've come to realize buildings are not telling our, the whole story. They're, they're not even telling most of the story. There, there are so, many, so much history that's in the ground that cannot be told uh, by, by the buildings themselves. Um, histories of traditionally uh, underrepresented groups and communities, uh, Native Americans, African Americans, uh, immigrant populations, et cetera, that their stories are, are in the ground and, and as we um, move the ground um, and, and, and do new development, those, those histories um, are being lost. And so that's, that's what uh, sort of spurred my interest in, in this and uh, wanted to continue uh, to have a conversation about uh, we, we need to be telling um, more than, than just one history. We need to be telling um, a, a wider history, a wider representation. So I just wanted to share, share those thoughts with you. Um, I'll turn and introduce uh, our panel members now. Um, sitting next to me, um, uh, Neil Dawson. He is an actively practicing architect in Savannah, has been since 1991. He founded and manages his own architectural practice, Dawson Architects, which special, specializes in historic renovation and ad adaptive reuse of historic buildings. Uh, he, he noted to me that almost all of the historic buildings that he's worked on uh, in the past have had uh, little or no uh, archaeological documentation or assessment. Uh, he's also um, found that typically construction workers um, um, may turn into treasure hunters and uh, find and keep artifacts on, on job sites, so that's, that's been a troubling um, concern of his. Uh, he's a proponent of a simple, community-based archaeological standard which could move us towards documentation and meaningful interpretation of archaeological resources. Next to him, I'd like to introduce Dr. Um, Pamela Cressy. She is the archaeologist for the city of Alexandria, Virginia. Um, they have one of the premier archaeology ar programs in the nation. Uh, just this year, uh, they were recognized by the Society for Historical Archaeology with the Daniel G. Roberts Award for Ex Excellence in Public Historical Archaeology. And they recognize the program uh, that has had 50 years of public service and excellence. Alexandria was the first recipient of this award, uh, and they were specifically recognized for outstanding public archaeological accomplishments due to its sustained commitment to public education, volunteerism, the Archaeology Museum, and unique public initiatives through the Office of Historic Alexandria, Alexandria Archaeology, Alexandria Archaeological Commission, and partnership activities with other city departments, the Friends of Alexandria Archaeology, and other groups and individuals. And this is, I'm sure, due in no small part uh, to, the, to the leadership and vision of Dr. Cressy. Um, next to her, I'd like to introduce uh, Sue Moore. She is a professor of anthropology and the director of Camp Lawton Project at Georgia Southern University in Statesboro. Uh, her research has included the plantation archaeology of the Georgia coast, as well as archaeological research in Florida and Oklahoma. She's authored a number of technical reports and other publications, and she is very active in state preservation and archaeology. She served as the president of the Society for Georgia Archaeology and as vice president of the Georgia Council of Professional Archaeologists. Um, and last but not least, I'd like to introduce uh, Richard Kanaski. He has served as the regional archaeologist for the Southeast Quadrant of the United States and the Caribbean. Um, 
In the southeast, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service owns or manages more than 4 million acres on 130 national wildlife refuge, refuge, refuges and 16 national uh, fish hatcheries. He is responsible for the region's historic preservation program, which includes maintaining the regional site and museum property databases, ensuring 106 compliance for service programs, facility, facilitating third-party scientific archaeological investigations on service land, working with the Refuge Law Enforcement to investigate potential Archaeological Resources Protection Act violations, and consulting with Indian tribes regarding repatriation and other related issues. So we are in, in um, very esteemable hands. And finally, I would like to introduce uh, the moderator of today's program, Michael Jordan. Uh, he is the president and founder of Cosmos Mariner Productions. He's a veteran uh, television journalist and uh, perhaps first and foremost a historian. He's traveled around uh, the world uh, with U.S. and allied soldiers, sailors, airmen, marines, bringing home fascinating stories about their courage, bravery, uh, and ingenuity. Uh, he produces in-depth documentaries and films about coastal Georgia's multifaceted history. Uh, he is a friend of mine and probably one of the most passionate, dedicated, and sincere people I know. So I am very happy to introduce all of these folks to you, and I know that we are going to have a really great program today. So please help me welcome these folks. Thanks, Helen, and thanks to everybody who's here. I'll be the second to thank you for taking time on your Saturday, but the first to ask you to turn your cell phone off. Uh, it's okay to take pictures with it, but if it's going to vibrate, buzz, or beep, please uh, crank it down now. I wanted to tell you a couple of stories. The first story is about a fellow who walked up to me when I was a news anchor at Channel 3 in Savannah. And he walked up to me at a Sand Nats game and said, I'm really upset about something. I, I know you're a news reporter and I want to talk to you. And I said, well, okay. And I was bracing for the inevitable. Somebody wants to corner me for half an hour and ask me about a story. But the guy broke down in tears and he said, I work on a job site and it's one that all of you will know, a very famous development in Savannah. He said, uh, we found some bones the other day and I didn't know what to do with them. I told my foreman and he said, whatever you do, don't tell anybody else, take them home. So he said, I took them home because I don't know what I'm supposed to do and I don't want to lose my job or shut my site down. I didn't know what to tell him and I still don't know what to tell him. Would not know what to tell him if he came up to me because we don't really have an answer for that question here in Savannah. He was told, I think, to tell the sheriff and the sheriff came and looked at it and said there doesn't seem to be anything historic, move on. But we don't have a good answer for that question. The other story is about one of my best friends who opened one of my favorite bars and he knew that he was building on a battle site. And I said, you know, you really ought to slow down a little bit. You could find some cool stuff that you might be able to work into the story of your bar, because he was interested in history. I said, people might come here to see the things you find. Ah, we gotta, we gotta get open, we gotta hurry. Well, sure enough, he found some musket balls, some gun parts. When is a musket ball just a musket ball? When you dig it up and put it on a shelf. We don't know who had that ball, where they dropped it, where they stood. I know from watching the archaeologists when I worked at Coastal Heritage Society that it's where things lay in relation to each other and where they lay as far as the depth they're in and the color of the soil stain that they're beside that can be pieced together with the evidence that's in the, the written record, that can be pieced together sometimes with drawings, and we can figure out where a thing is in relation to the story that's happening around it. So if we rush through these things, we destroy these stories. Let me see your hand if you're an archaeologist. Are there any archaeologists in the room? Raise your hand if you know an archaeologist. <laughs> I think we're probably preaching to the choir today. And that's okay because we have to start somewhere. And we may not need to have what each of us thinks we need. We need to talk about it and figure out what we do need to have. But starting a dialogue is the best way, I think, to start so that we can begin to peel back the layers the right way and figure out how to tell these stories. So that's why. I think archaeology is important, and that is the first question that uh, we turn to today and ask our panelists. Why is archaeology important? No particular order. Jump in anywhere you like. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't we start with our architect? Why is archaeology important? Well, I, as Helen said in the introduction, I've, uh, over the last 20 years in Savannah, I've seen countless resources just discarded or stocked for private use or who knows what, but they just disappear. 
And I've worked on, on a few projects that I had professional archaeology, which is sort of maybe the other end of the pendulum. No offense to the rest of the panelists, but I, it's hard enough to get projects done, but when you make it so that you can't get projects done, I don't think that's necessarily what we need. But if there was something that was better than nothing, I think it would, uh, uh, there's just a lot of history that's lost as a community, and it's a sad mm -hmm. thing. An archaeologist beyond a paycheck. <laughs> Why is archaeology important? I, I'll jump in. Um, I think it's important, one, obviously we want to tell stories of people who can't tell those stories anymore. Uh, they're gone, uh, and that means everybody from Native American populations to more recent uh, individuals. But also, you know, there's an economic uh, impact that archaeology has, and I think sometimes we forget about that. Um, that it can actually enhance things like tourism and bringing people in. So I see it as, as one of those win-win things. I get to tell stories for people, and, and that is personally the reason that I do it. But it also is good, I think, uh, for the community in an economic sense. Uh, I think stories are extremely important. I agree with you, Sue, and I think it's how people connect with archaeology even more than the objects themselves. Um, and I, but I'd also like to make the point that I think archaeology is important because archaeology is, in fact, places. And I think places are what have power. That is very much why architecture speaks to people, because it's a place. Or a tree is physically, tangibly there, and you know if it's missing. Places that are buried or places that have something above ground but still have things hidden underground, it is the fact that the site is there and intact. That is an incredible resource. And what we have to do as archaeologists in communities is, is allow those places to survive and not just mine them out and have them a part of a contributing uh, dialogue and dialectic in the community. I'm going to ask all of our panelists to pull the mics closer to you because we're competing with a big lawnmower now. Okay. Um, and to basically add to that, uh, one of the things that I always, you know, that I always tell our, our refuge staff is that one of the things you not only talk about why fish and wildlife exist or why our national wildlife refuge is important. One of the things that people ask about is, what is the history of that place, that landscape? And how we talk about what we do and why it's important that we do it is you bring them in and tell them the history of the people that lived on that landscape and how they managed it, manipulated it, modified it. it that's all part of the story that you can actually get from an archaeological site, from the archaeological context. But then there are also much broader things that you can talk about. You can talk about uh, what did this, land, this place look like 500 years ago? What did this place look like 5,000 years ago? What, where did these items come from? How did they make these items? So there are much broader questions that we can ask and address from well thought out well done archaeological investigations and, and excavations. One point we should address too is that not everything must be preserved. In some cases, simply studying what's there, like the shipwreck that was studied uh, under the Highway 17 bridge to expand over the Back River going into South Carolina. Just documenting what was there, mapping it, tells the story and tells us enough that it's not something that is so rare or so special it needs to be saved. And in other cases, the artifacts that are found may not be needed by museums. There may be enough of them that that collector can still take it home, but it's where it's found that tells the story. So any thoughts about that? About whether we have the level of preservation that needs to happen. I mean, just because something is there, does it always need to be saved? I think that's the fear that a lot of developers have. Well, I think we can safely say in urban areas, there's archeological materials virtually everywhere. Are they all equal to one another? No. 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 Right. But um, you need a, an understanding and a community sense of what is significant. And that's one of the biggest places to start in a local program, mm -hmm. is to actually lay out themes and information and what's missing right. and what's known. 
And generally, in terms of archaeology, there's not a lot of knownness. But you can go through, um, you can go through reports that have already been done. Where's Rita Elliott? Are you here, Rita? I'm sorry, did you just yeah. Earlier? Yes, Rita and Rita and Dan prepared a little overview for me. There's more than 1,200 archaeological sites recorded in this city and in the county. 1,200 recorded and almost 400 reports that have been written. Well, how could those be studied to begin to understand themes and stories and put that together with traditional history and photographic history and oral history to actually develop a plan and a statement of significance mm -hmm. and identify places where there is the best chance of learning. So developers need to know that there are standards and that, that each site is being judged fairly and going through a process mm -hmm. of assessment where you start with the least invasive and most informative and move through. And as you move through the process, many sites won't make the grade. And the sooner you start the process, the more you know your liability as a developer mm -hmm. and the more you can see the benefit of using archaeology mm -hmm. or the information that comes even if no archaeology is done in creating unique Properties. Can everybody hear? Do we need to pull the mics closer? Yeah, we've got to really talk right into them. Like you're on, a, on the X Factor or American Idol. <laughs> you, you don't get to vote anybody off, though, sorry. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> and to follow up on that, no, not every archaeological site is, is equal, but every archaeological site is, is effectively is a non renewable resource. And part of the process. Part of the investigation is to, you know, through identify, you know, parameters, uh, integrity, research value, um, uniqueness, you know, research questions, you know, the directions that you want to go. Then you can make that cut as to whether this site meets, whether it's the local, county, state, or national level of significance. And if it doesn't, then the process should stop at that point. But part of the other thing that goes into this, if a project is being investigated or evaluated early on in the planning process, the developer or the person who owns the property basically has time to modify the plans, whether it's landscaping or placements of buildings, so that they can avoid or protect and preserve significant archaeological resources as they go through the process. So that way, if, you know, you may say, well, we, we may not want to dig that particular or excavate that particular archaeological site, but we'll put it in a park-like setting, or we'll, we'll put it in a kind of place or down the road if we do wish to do excavations or do additional research there, it will be protected and there will be an opportunity to do it. But we've modified our, our, our game plan, so to speak. But again, it's early on in the process. You can't do this late in the process. If you do it as an add-on, that's when I get all, you know, when I, when I deal with refuse staff, or I deal with the other programs in the Fish and Wildlife Service, it's always because, oh, we need to talk to Rick. Uh, and it's like, well, we have to do this project, you know, we're getting ready to go out with this project in two days, and it's like, sorry. It's not gonna be two days. It's, a, you know, for, for under the federal law, State Historic Preservation Offices have a, a mandated 30 days to review and comment on any undertaking or project and that time frame starts when it arrives in their office. Now, I also have to talk to the federally recognized tribes as part of the Section 106 process. They have no such time limit under the National Historic Preservation Act. So the earlier you bring that project to my desk to review, the more likely it will get done within the time frame that one wants right. to have it accomplished. And it's not sitting languishing uh, um, you know, you know, everybody's going. Oh, when is it going to be ready? It'll be ready whenever you know 
when it works its way through the process. Well, as a follow-on to that, I'm going to ask you to raise that up there. You're crashing. Sorry. There it goes again. Um, what about those federal and state laws? And anybody else can jump in on this, too, that you already work with. How do they apply in a place like Savannah? Do they, do they matter within the city limits, or are they only going to apply to government projects like the ones you're talking about? Well, the federal historic preservation laws require to be triggered you know, by the city of Savannah would require some sort of federal nexus. In other words, you would have to have federal funding or some sort of federal permit connection to, to basically fall under the National Historic Preservation Act. Um, under the state law, you would, you would have to, you know, actually you'd probably fall under was a need for a permit or something from the state. Uh, so it, it really just kind of... The umbrella doesn't go that far then? No, uh, no. Yeah, in other words, if it's on private property and you're not getting a federal permit, then you're not. You, you don't fall right. under anything. Mm -hmm. Then if you are working on a federal project like a, a highway or state project, then a portion of those funds must be done for surveying to make sure you're not disturbing anything, correct? Is that still the law? It's, yeah, well, yes. Uh, and and, and uh, the, the actual the act actually talks about 1% of to total project costs, but that usually doesn't pan out. Basically, for, for something like a federal highway project or a federally funded project, you'll end up with a mix of, you know, what's called archaeological reconnaissance, which is basically, you know, the first phase of identification. It's a large-scale survey with follow-up testing to ascertain whether a site actually possesses research value or significance, basically to determine its eligibility for inclusion on the National Register. And if the project cannot be redesigned or moved away, then you end up with the, the last phase, which is data recovery of excavation. Uh, and often that, you know, when you get to that phase, you're often not only involving the agency who, who funded the project, the relevant state historic preservation office, uh, members of the community, but depending on the type of site, you may be also talking to one or more uh, fairly recognized tribes. And much of the, that is actually being done under what's called a programmatic agreement or a memorandum of, of, of agreement, which lays out this is how we're mitigating those, those adverse effects. Okay. Well, it's obvious to tourists in Savannah that Savannah is a very well-preserved city above the ground. Now, people that I've seen here today are, are, are those who are involved in either preserving those structures or interpreting them to the public. But uh, do we need an ordinance, in your opinions, to preserve what's below the ground here in Savannah? Do we need a law on the books locally to do that? I would say that we need something. I mean, as an architect involved mostly in private development, there's just too much that, that is lost. Now, you know, when you start talking about these federal reviews, it kind of scares me because it, it's hard enough to get a project done without it. Um, but if there was some way that there was an ordinance that uh, I like your idea of, of themes and ideas of importance, your idea of identifying in advance areas of relevance are ones that we know, you know, if this used to be the site of the governor's house or whatever. If there was some way as a developer or an architect we knew in advance areas or themes that would have importance, then I think we could approach them in a way that was appropriate for the resources we might find. But to have nothing I think is, is inappropriate, but I, I don't know what the, I don't, certainly don't like the federal level. I think that would kill my business. I wouldn't have anything else to do. <laughs> I think some type of uh, legal approach is necessary unless some of all of you take on a voluntary approach uh, which has been done at various college towns mm -hmm. where there is a graduate student who has an internship or research associateship who reviews all site plans 
and provides comments. And then you see if there's some kind of voluntary action or the university goes ahead and does the work. Um, this is hard to keep up, frankly. <laughs> However, if you start it, it may turn out pretty good. So Judy Benz in Pensacola, she didn't start voluntarily. She started, I believe, with a very big federal project with that mm -hmm. energy company. Mm -hmm. But because the work was so high profile and so valuable, she took it on then as uh, a university professor and citizen to really expand far out and start reviewing site plans and then going to council and speaking because she actually had firsthand knowledge of volume you know, workload and what would be required, and then argued as a citizen passionately for a local code, which has now turned out to an entire statewide system of community archaeologists. So the right person, just energy-wise, can start it off in an initiative. But what's important long-term is the process that is embedded in the planning process of the jurisdiction and that you get in at the earliest time and everybody knows the exact process and you find out, um, I mentioned this yesterday, you find out about archaeology liability at the same time you find out about toxic waste. It becomes another thing on the checklist, everything that their legal team, the engineering team knows about and there are standard materials that they know to bring forth, um, overlay maps, GIS studies, aerial photos that can easily be tapped and done overlays to see, well, what has been the change over time? Maybe the place has already been quarried. Um, core testing uh, in some places rather than shovel testing. Maybe historical documentation, but you lay it out in a, a, the code wouldn't state all of that, but you have standards and a scope of work that is written uh, by the local staff so that each developer gets a fair and comprehensive uh, uh, work, pro not product, but requirement that can be bid out into competing firms rather than just, you got to do archaeology and they go pick their brother-in-law. You've got to have a way to certify the credentials. That would never happen in Savannah. <laughs> <laughs> or anywhere. I didn't never think happened. so. I didn't think so. But we have had developers ask, you know, couldn't their mom do the historical <laughs> research? I'm a mom. Yes, moms can do historical research, but what are you going to do with the mass of it? Um, just like we have architectural firms that say, well, can't we write the text for the interpretive marker? Well, it doesn't work. I can't keep a building up by drawing on a napkin. I, that is not my skill set. So if you hire the right people, then you're going to get a better product. But you have to have a staff person in a compliance role but also then to encourage things of partnerships with the rest of the departments in the local jurisdiction and voluntary groups so that art, education, uh, recreation, trails, tourism, all of that is punched up with as many sites as possible. Many winners, many stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, the, and the thing is, is not, it's not only important to have the process, you know, these are the standards, this is, you know, this is how you're going to move through that process, but this is the final product that you're going to get out of it. There has to be something that is not necessarily just the collections, but an actual report that actually interprets the work that was done and then can be turned around and used as an interpretive tool. One of the things that's really important is folks, if they understand what's happened at this site, they get excited about it and they feel a sense of ownership and pride about it and it becomes much easier to move through this process down the road and much, much easier to uh, uh, recruit for you know, volunteers who are willing to spend sometimes hard hot days out in the sun doing excavations or testing or washing artifacts or cataloging. Uh, so if you have not only the process, the standards, the qualifications for individuals doing it, but also something that says here at the end, this is the product that we're going to have. And that, that, then you've got the beginnings of the real program and something that will go somewhere. 
Well, two quick points, and I'm going to ask somebody to correct me if I'm wrong. I don't think there's any school in Savannah proper doing archaeology training now. I know Georgia Southern does. Am I right about that? I know that I took an archaeology class with Ann Yench at Armstrong and realized I'd be a terrible archaeologist, but I think she moved. They did with Judd uh, Kretzer. Kretzen. Yeah, you have a fabulous program in Georgia Southern with uh, Camp Lawton, but it would be difficult to get that. You know, we have a great art school, we do historic preservation here, but there's not really anybody teaching archaeology in Savannah. Could you send us some students? Sure. <laughs> I, I, I've got some. <laughs> the other thing that uh, really comes to mind, Rick, with your comments was uh, when Rita, working through Coastal Heritage Society, did the dig in Madison Square, and it was to find evidence of the, the 1779 siege of Savannah. And just the act of digging there in that public space and the signage that you put up got buy-in from business owners like Esther Shaver, who was coming out every day and sending her customers out, and tourists would stop, and dogs would stop, and it was fabulous. So there is a way to make this exciting to the, to the public at large. You've also got some really good volunteer organizations mm -hmm. in the community. I'm thinking about the Coastal Georgia Archaeological Society, who really... I don't know how many times has been out doing things in the community, really helping. Um, so there, there are lots of ways, I think, to make it work. Well, let's talk about ways that archaeology can add value to a development. Let's say I'm a developer and I'm coming to you and I'm saying, hey, there might be something here. Why should I care? Why should I try? Well, no, not why should I care. Historians and archaeologists know why you should care. Why should I care as a developer? Why should I put my effort into this and slow down? Give me the value for, for me. Well, I think one of the key points is that developers are frequently members of the community, and what they are doing needs to contribute to the larger whole. And that is why there are site plans. That's why counties and local jurisdictions review site plans so that they are up to code, so that they are safe, and so that they have certain beautification, because it is viewed in many, many cities today that each development is adding value. Mm -hmm. It is adding business, it is adding to the community. And developers want to do that as well as to make money. And they want to walk away and say, this, this, I'm glad this building is up, this is valuable. They bring their children there, they teach them these kinds of things. They're not doing it just, many of them, slapdash. If you really sit and talk to them, architects want projects that matter, that they are proud of, um, and that others will talk of or set standards. Um, and I think that's very important to tap into them as citizens. I don't think it should ever be viewed as conflict or competition. You want developers on committees and commissions. You want various viewpoints. We went to the development community to create our code before we did anything, and we asked the development attorneys to lay out if there was a code, how would they want it? And they said, we want it early, we don't want it capricious, we want to understand exactly what's needed and wanted, we want to cost it out in the beginning, and we want a timeline on it. And we want assurance that it, when it's done, it's done, <laughs> and that there isn't some other surprise. And that gave us the, the structure so that then when we went into the city attorney's office or talking to planners, we knew the place to enter was at the site plan process, which is where developers are initially presenting their information. And in Alexandria, there's a pre-concept meeting before anything's on paper to make sure that they're going in the right direction. And we got, have gotten to the point where, um, and this was before even, um, you know, the kinds of emailing that we're doing now, but we would have real estate people or developers calling us from their car phones saying, I'm at such and such address. Can you tell me if, if somebody buys this and puts up a commercial property, will archaeology have to be done? Because we, we asked for a preliminary assessment before this pre-concept part of the process started, and we could then tell them, uh, well, uh, th you know, no. We, we, I could check in 10 minutes and determine the potential of the site, given the type of data that we had in maps, and say, no, when you enter the process, you will, you will get a check off from us. 
And we could also demonstrate statistically um, that only about 30 or 40 percent of development is going to get any, any comment from us at all. And then it will always be first do a historical study or do um, coring or whatever it is that's associated with the project, but it is not, you just call out 100 people and you spend two years digging. You know, they could really see the timing of it. Well, as a follow-on to that, when you go into historic hotels and restaurants in Savannah, the walls are going to be papered with pictures that they've licensed from Georgia Historical of what it used to look like. When you go to Beaufort, where they have you know, an archaeology ordinance, one of the things in the visitor center is stuff they found and what it means and what the story is. Do you find anybody buying into it so much as a business that one of the things on the shelf in the restaurant is what they found when they erected it? People really get into it that much? Uh, sometimes they do. I think more photographs than objects. I, and the other thing about objects, because our code requires that the collection be curated to federal standards, because otherwise, you know, they're just sitting in somebody's garage, or you, they, then they really do lose their value. So we, we're, we're fine with somebody uh, keeping some of the collection and using it. We find developers more likely to put it in their corporate offices. Or, or actually send them to people that they have joint ventures with in uh, Holland or Japan. Because in Japan, a 4,000-year-old stone tool is pretty cool. And they like to be able to demonstrate that, this, that there is um, a sense of uh, valuing ancestors in America and that the project did not blitz the past. So we get more of that than a restaurant who just wants to put up stuff yeah. as a curio. But the message is archaeology, try it, you'll like it right. for these developers. Right. And okay. I think the other part of this, too, in terms of, if I could just finish up the uh, kind of question, uh, larger question, and that is, uh, what is the value? I think um, every developer looks for the name of a project, every architect looks for beyond just the code, what's the character of this place going to be, so do interior designers and so do landscape architects. Um, and if you're opening a business, so do people when you go to develop a menu. And I think all of this, if you have the history ahead of time, it influences in the photographs, historic photographs, or even the oral history of workers who were there. All of this goes into the creative energy of the people involved. And then you end up with oftentimes prize-winning projects where they would have been just boxes. And then you're, they are winning professionally and they have a landmark that people will remember. I was gonna say the, the same thing and that's happening in places like St. Augustine has an ordinance, um, does things like that. Um, and they're now award-winning for some of the way that they're using the archeology span to enhance the development and I think that's the way we need to think of it, not uh, that they conflict with each other, but they are mutually uh, good at enhancing each other. <clears throat> well, would any of you care to weigh in on what Savannah should do with artifacts that it does find? And you've kind of spoken to it a little bit, but where should we put them? What should we do with them? You may not have toured Savannah, so if you don't have any specific <laughs> ideas, like, I'd put them. I mean, the, the thing is, is the, the whole issue of curation of archaeological mm -hmm. questions is always one that dogs most of us. Uh, and I think having a, a well thought out uh, curation plan and, and a repository for housing those is one thing. And two, to realize not every single artifact or, mm -hmm. or item that's recovered is going to be of museum property or exhibit that, you know, quality. But the value of those collections, particularly the ones that have good documentation or well provenience, is that they are also uh, places where archaeologists and graduate mm -hmm. students in archaeology can mm -hmm. then go back and, and reevaluate or ask slightly different questions from uh, the original excavations. So they have research value beyond just exhibit value. So having a, a, a good repository that, that, that meets the federal standards, that is well maintained and that other folk, you know, the other graduate students, other researchers, other archaeologists and can then go and utilize it and periodically, places like, you know, the 
museums here in town or let's say you might want to have uh, an exhibit on a particular um, house or, 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 or group of folks here in town and you might want to have it like in, in a, you know, city hall or something like that, you have a place to go and you can pull portions of that collection, you know, different collections to, to create those exhibits. Well, this is a challenge because all, you know, with the recession, funds are short and all of our, all of our museums are full and struggling to keep track and store appropriately what they do have and curate what they do have. Typically, what, you know, when I scope out a project, I build those costs into the cost estimate as well as in the scope requirements so that the people who are bidding on, on those projects or who are coming to us for uh, uh, whether it's a, an Archaeological Resources Protection Act permit or an Antiquity Act permit, they understand that they have to maintain, you know, have those collections meet the federal standards and submit them to, you know, to an appropriate repository so that they definitely will build those curation costs into their final cost for doing that work. So it's not finders keepers. It's not, I found it on my land, it belongs to me. Oh, it does belong to It, it does belong to you. private lands, yeah. Mm -hmm. It does belong, and you need deeds of gift. And I think this is oftentimes what does not happen mm -hmm. in archaeology. Archaeologists dig, but then there is no regular museum accessioning that would require ownership. Mm -hmm. And so it's really important that the, the owner, if it's a company or whatever, mm -hmm. that there's a temporary uh, loan form for while the artifacts mm -hmm. are being taken out and processed, and then a permanent deed of gift so that you, whoever has ultimate ownership. I think it's also possible, again, if you get a task force or a group of interested people working through 10 or 12 issues, is it's possible to start looking for space and looking for partners. Um, lots of buildings need rehabbing. Lots of groups are looking for partners. Um, education, some schools are not being fully used, some rec centers. Um, how could you create a program even uh, for maybe going through and cataloging, mm -hmm. accessioning, all the stuff that's wherever, wherever all these 300 and some sites that have been dug, where is all the stuff? And could any universities, you know, use some funds that would go mm -hmm. to students anyhow? Or could somebody have a program to help um, a, a certain group of disadvantaged youth or a summer core program? You can use money from different sources to do mm -hmm. a variety of things. And you can then, uh, in some places, they've built archaeological repositories and facilities right. into schools. And the children are actually a part of the process or learning the process while the archaeologists are there. So um, dovetailing, mm -hmm. even unlikely partners, mm -hmm. it, you can find funding. Yeah, I was going to mention, we hadn't talked about how you could use it, the collections as educational materials. But certainly, you want to reach out to schools uh, and get uh, and utilize some of this uh, in teaching and, and getting those students coming through and becoming interested in what you're doing. Uh, and, and maybe then we don't have to answer this question of, of why we do it, because they'll know, that they'll, they'll understand that. Um, and I think Glenn County has a really good thing um, with Fort Frederica where all of the fourth grade kids go through that. Um, they, they dig. Uh, they process, they do all of that sort of stuff with the artifacts so that they learn about it. Um, and I think there would certainly be resources to be able to do something like that. And, uh, you know, resources like Georgia Historical Society where, mm -hmm. you know, you can, like you say, is a repository of research information. Mm -hmm. I think it's always helpful for me as an architect to know that I can go to a place and learn more about the history of a site or if, if there's a site that's similar, like if we have a a burial site or a Native American site, if there's some information that would help me learn more about what it was like over there so that we can do a better job on a current project. I mean, those kind of places are, I think, great places to house that. Is there a, a, a threshold at which you should trigger an archaeological investigation? Let's say it is a site that you know could be. What triggers it? Obviously not just mowing the lawn or sometimes putting in a fence post could be enough to disturb something. How do you know when you need to pull the trigger on it? Um, we use ground disturbance. <laughs> That's the term we yeah. use, ground disturbance. However, 
um, in developing our ordinance, we really thought it would be um, too extreme to require archaeology by individual homeowners for what an individual homeowner is doing. It is just too much. So what we do, we monitor ground disturbance of permits for things like um, pool construction, uh, putting on additions, demolitions, uh, those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And we ask voluntarily to come over, view the property, or have them call us. And we come and record things. Or if it's extremely important, we'll go ahead and recover it. it the materials belong to them, and they would need to sign it over to us. But one way or another, we're at least getting information. However, in larger development projects, basically, if you're entering at the site plan process, there's all kinds of things that are happening. But you want to have a, um, some type of tickler system, like in your permitting process, because the construction might start more with demolition or might start with grading. So you have to monitor things like grading permits not just a construction permit to know that the archaeology has been done in sufficient time. And when you write on the site plans themselves, the big blueprints, there's lots of notes. You want to write the notes there to the construction manager because they follow each one of those notes to a T. And they are drawn by engineers, they're certified by engineers, and they say at each step, must call archaeology and give the phone number before starting ground disturbance two weeks in advance. That goes on a construction timetable. And those timetables aren't silly. They're not like my to-do list that I don't do half of it. They're, they're very serious. People have to check that mm -hmm. stuff off. And the contractor will pay attention to that. That's what they're paid to do. And so it's, the, it's not just the concept. It's the execution at every place in your locality, so there's constant feedback in the loop. Rick, I think I cut you off a second ago. Did you want to add something, or did we move too far away? No, I mean, ground disturbing activities is effectively what tr triggers uh, my reviews. But basically, what I mean, under Section 106, there's effectively a two-pronged test that that uh, that I apply. One is it funded, permitted, or done by the agency. The second is, will that particular activity have the potential, or possess the potential to impact some type of historic property? And I use the term historic property. We've been talking about archeological sites. I, I deal with a much broader sense of, of, of historic properties. I deal not only with the archeological sites, I deal with historic buildings and structures, cultural and historic landscapes, as well as sites of religious and cultural significance to the tribe. So I have a much broader portfolio than what we're talking about here. But it, it's a specific activity is what you have to look at. You have to look at what you're actually doing. There, may, there are many kinds of things that are repetitive kinds of activities. Like, you know, you're, you're regrading the street, you know, an existing road. If you stay within the road footprint and you're not digging 10 feet down in order to, to redo your road, you're not really going to have an impact. But if you're putting in a new road at a new location, that's what will trigger what I say. Yeah. So there's some common sense there. Yeah, there is common sense. <laughs> I, would, I would love to see the triggers tied to construction expenditures, the amount of soil disturbance, mm -hmm. the importance of the site, uh, some kind of matrix where the standard is different based on the project's either perceived importance or potential importance and the amount of money and who's doing it. I mean, if it's a multi-million dollar we're digging up a, a, you know, a two acre site in the historic district, that standard should be different than somebody that's just putting in you know, a road resurfacing. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I would also like to see some kind of incentives in an ordinance that if, I, and I don't know how you all do your work, I assume there's sort of levels of detail that you go through, but you know, if, if somebody voluntarily um, wanted to do more research that maybe there were some development incentives, you know, maybe they get a 1% break on the parking requirements or who knows. Um, but you know, there's a number of zoning requirements that are detrimental to development so I think maybe if there was an exceedance in another area, perhaps mm -hmm. archaeology, that maybe it would help 
uh, give some incentives to folks to, to actually go after some, some resources. We are almost, we've almost exhausted the questions I was given to ask you. So Ellen, Ellen, if you could get your microphone folks ready, we'll turn it over to the people in the audience, most of whom are far more expert on this stuff than I am. But I do have one more question for you, and I'll tell you what my answer would be. What is your favorite success story? What have you learned? What is the, the most resounding, heartwarming thing you can tell me, each of you, about your involvement with archaeology in this context? And, and I can tell you mine is the, the things that Dan Elliott, wherever he went, there he is, what Dan found at Point Peter, a development-funded project on the Georgia coast that has given us an 1812 story. As we observe the, the, the bicentennial of the War of 1812, most folks don't know Georgia has a story, but it was because of a development on the water that we know about the, the British invasion of Point Peter and the things that happened there. Can any of you folks speak to something like that, uh, something that wouldn't have happened if it weren't for a city, a business, a community coming together to care about archaeology? I think Camp Lawton certainly is, is a good mm -hmm. poster child for that because that really was a, a case of where the state asked us to do that project and unbeknownst to us, we were going to make friends uh, with Rick uh, because part of it was on federal property and so uh, we, we got everybody involved there. But that was a case of where the community really did want to know something and they, they wanted the archaeology to be done. So it's been very gratifying to me to be able to give back, you know, and, and, and really start to tell those stories and, and do something with that. So it's been, it's fabulous. And Camp Lawton is a Civil War POW camp in right. Millen, Georgia, correct? Right. Um, I think probably one of the, it, and it's more of an oral history than a, an artifact, but uh, when we were doing the SCAD Museum, there was a lot of research on uh, some of the brick and where it was made, uh, I think done by the Historic Preservation Department. And part of what came out of that were there's some oral history stories of um, uh, one, one uh, former slave couple that one, one escaped and then after the Civil War came back and, and she was able to reunite with her husband. And I don't know how they dug up this incredible oral history, but I think those kind of stories, um, they, they told that at the groundbreaking at the SCAD Museum. And that, that still is a touching history that I think would be lost if somebody hadn't taken the time to really research and find out, okay, where, where, where did this stuff come from? Who are the people that put this place together? I think uh, my heart, most heartwarming uh, aspect of archaeology has been related to a cemetery site of contraband and freedmen in Alexandria. Alexandria was once a part of the District of Columbia, uh, but retroceded to Virginia before the Civil War and was then occupied, um, actually, uh, the entire war and then four years later for a total of eight years of occupation and federal rule. And um, the feds buried um, the runaway refugees uh, in a cemetery that they just took from Robert E. Lee's cousin, just took, took the land, buried people, and then left. And the property uh, was forgotten and finally became a gas station an office building. Uh, the Capitol Beltway cut through it, and an off-ramp of the Capitol Beltway came on one side of it, the George Washington Parkway went on to another side of it, and a brickyard was cutting into it uh, in the 1890s to mine clay to the point that the coffins were sticking out of the sides of the cemetery like uh, cannons out of a fort, is the way the journalists described it. Um, in 1987, our city historian found this journalist's statement by reading microphone. And we had enough information, who, what, why, when, and where, great journalist, no byline, to say where this was, which was a, this gas station. And so um, over the decades, we've watched over this property so that anybody who wanted to develop it we said, oh, it's a, it's, it's a cemetery, but nobody would believe there would be bodies at a gas station. And a whole series of events occurred that we could have never choreographed very, very much like what you're talking about, we as archaeologists. But the, the, the power of the story 
and the people who stood up out of the blue, uh, somebody found the record of all the deaths at the State Library cataloged under the wrong name. Uh, somebody else uh, went to a public hearing and heard that the federal government in redoing the Wilson Bridge was going to buy the site and turn it into construction equipment holding tank and build a road on top of it. And the archaeologists had declared that no adverse effect um, and thought that was wrong and went out. Anyhow, it has now been 27 years and we are at the point where there will be a $15 million memorial built over three acres that the city has purchased. And there's been steering committees all developed of the citizens, a worldwide competition of design done on the web uh, with people c contributing from all over the planet for designs, uh, now a sculpture competition. Um, and we hired a genealogist who has found descendants of more than 100 people of the 1700 buried there. And the construction should start next week to be finished next year. Um, people care whether it's their class, their race, or their land. It's a compelling story. Mm -hmm. And the community feels it's right and wrong, that there's a conscience in today's community based upon what's happened in the past. Obviously, uh, Sue has already stolen my thunder about <laughs> Camp Water. <laughs> uh, so I'll tell you a slightly different one that, in de that deals with Native Americans. Uh, one of our national fish hatcheries in um, northwestern Louisiana, Natchitoches National Fish Hatcheries, uh, is actually built, was built, on a fairly well-known late prehistoric, early historic Caddo Cemetery uh, back in the 1930s. Um, we worked with the Caddo Nation on a variety of things, but uh, the, where archaeology came uh, involved is um, University of uh, what is it, uh, Northwest Louisiana, uh, where the uh, one of the district or uh, regional archaeologists for the Louisiana uh, Division of Archaeology is housed, did came to us and wanted to do. Uh, testing or ex block excavation on a deeply buried uh, small Caddo house homestead that's located on the hatchery uh, beneath about a meter or about three or four feet of alluvium. And from that, that particular site was listed on the National Register of Historic Places. That ended up leading us to have discussions with the Caddo Nation on repatriation of human skeletal remains that actually we no longer had control over but the Smithsonian did. The Smithsonian is, is essentially exempt from the Native American Grave Protection and Repatriation Act. It has its own act that basically says you will work with the Native Americans regarding care and repatriation or, or treatment of human skeletal remains that, that are associated or affiliated with them. Um, that ended up leading to uh, repatriation of a of, of limited number of remains that were there with some uh, associated funeral objects. And then working with the tribe, identified a location within the hatchery grounds that we were not going to be developing any time in the near future. Uh, for use as part of the hatchery and setting that aside for a re, uh, reinterment or a reburial ground uh, and ended up negotiating an actual formal agreement with them uh, which was signed at the 50th uh, Caddo conference that happened to be uh, in Natchitoches that year. Um, as part of all of that uh, we have on um, many of our hatcheries we have like visitor centers or or aquariums, so to speak. And we actually worked with the tribe, our, re our hatchery staff did, and created a permanent exhibit on what a cattle village would look like at, at point of contact in the you know, 15th century. We also then worked with the tribe and essentially um, basically dedicated the hatchery as a sacred site or a site of cultural significance to the tribe. 
and we had a formal ceremony that was well attended by not only uh, members of the Caddo Nation, but fellow archaeologists who were attending the Caddo Conference, as well as members of the local community, including, including a number of uh, politicians like the mayor and whatnot. So it became a, a big community event. Part of the uh, agreement is, is that they, the nation itself, will have access to the reinterment, you know, burial for uh, cemetery for ceremonies and have a degree of privacy and um, will be able to reinter other individuals that may have come from this site but no longer, that may be in state control or in private control or come from archaeological sites that are nearby. A lot of success stories. Well, let's open the floor up for questions. And uh, who's got the microphone? All right. Here's the rule. Please speak into the microphone with your question. And uh, if anybody doesn't hear it, uh, raise your hand. We'll repeat it for you. Go ahead, Daniel. Thanks. I appreciate the comments this afternoon. My question, I guess, is addressed to Dr. Tressy with her experience in Alexandria. How did the city begin um, its archaeological protection? Did it? Did it do it as a component to an existing preservation ordinance, that, say as an add-on, or did they start from scratch? And how would you recommend Savannah undertake, you know, something similar to be, you know, effective and protective here? I don't know. Uh, I don't know enough about, you know, how your code is established here. But we had a major impediment in Alexandria, and that is. Um, the Commonwealth of Virginia operates under Dillon's rule, which means every locality has only the express powers given to it, written down. And it didn't have any power to do anything on archaeological sites. It had the power to control structures, which was under historic preservation code. Um, so we, did, we had no entry. And that prohibited everything for a while till we got a brilliant city attorney who said, well, we have the uh, express power to control the movement of soil. So we came in under grading <laughs> and under what eventually became <laughs> in the zoning code under site plans. So there's not, and you'll see it's on our website. If you go to it, alexandriaarchaeology.org, and you will see the code, we've actually kind of cribbed together pieces that fall under different parts of the zoning code. And so, no, we're not under preservation. But it actually was brilliant because it put us in this process and the closest to the people who do move dirt, who were the ones we needed to be, the way the community viewed it, to be in partnership. And the other start point was, we have an archaeological commission. I don't know how many others there are in the country. I think I've heard of one in Michigan that is archaeological and historical. I think the biggest reformation in America that could happen at community level is every community have an archaeological commission. It doesn't cost a cent. And it takes people who care, they don't have to have knowledge, to begin the dialogue and continue the dialogue of what's important and what do we need to do. And because they'd be appointed directly by a city council and mayor, they're giving reports, they're going to meetings, they have standing, they're put on other commissions and committees and task force for planning things. And that gives the voice to archaeology. They were the ones who said, we're driving around the streets and we see the developers actually destroying the past. The city is putting in money for an archaeology program. We need a partnership. If you're going to tear apart the city's history, then you need to participate in its preservation. And so it was, I think, their commitment. I would have not thought of this because I don't think as archaeologists we're trained to think we have a heck of a lot of power. We're not trained as citizen activists, and we're often buried in, literally, uh, agencies <laughs> yeah. and organizations where there's not a lot of personal power. And the public thinks things bigger and has experience in backgrounds and friends. And, and they can w stand up and say all kinds of things that the rest of us wouldn't imagine to do. 
And so I think some kind of task force here that would um, marshal interested people and begin a year-long study to develop a plan that might turn into, may, yes, maybe a code and ordinance, but definitely a permanent commission that would, would monitor or a part of something else. Not that it couldn't be a part of your resource commission already. However, I do see that sometimes if you then just add archaeology and maybe you add one archaeology representative, it, it gets buried once again. So again, not in competition, but just a voice. You said this is on your website, the process that's used there is spilled out? Yes. The what is the website? The, uh, AlexandriaArchaeology.org. Uh, or if you just go to City of Alexandria, then you will, you, so alexandriava.gov backslash archaeology. Next question. Glenda. Oh, I'm sorry. This gentleman over here. In light of the economic situation that we're all familiar with, do you think there is any possibility of forming uh, un unorthodox uh, partnerships such as the National Geographic Society formed? with the U.S. Marine Corps in the 1980s to excavate the 16th century ruins on Paris Island. Is there any room for that still? I mean, can we look for new ways to uh, get resources? And which, by the way, left the Marine Corps as the conservator and the owner of everything the National Geographic dug out. It's still over there. I think that's always a possibility. Um, I don't know about everybody out here, historic preservation is not generally the most well-funded uh, thing in the world that we do. Um, so we're always trying to be creative and come up with ways of, of subsidizing archaeology, preservation, everything. Um, so yeah, I think things like reaching out to schools, um, partnering with them, going after grants with them as partners is, a, is one way. And, and I'm working on a project at um, Camp Lawton where the school is actually helping us estimate some stuff through a grant the school has. So, you know, it's, it's, it can be done, and you just have to sort of sit and think about it. The thing is, is a lot of the archaeological investigations that are done in, in my agency or through my agency or under my auspices is, is typically done through third-party partnerships. I mean, I, I work with, you know, like Sue at Georgia Southern. I work with Ken Sassman at University of Florida, Nancy White at University of South Florida, Ed Jackson at University of South Mississippi. So I have a lot of research partnerships out there that, that I'm not necessarily driving or funding the work. Uh, they, they have come to me and say, we, we have an interest in this area, and this is the research that we want to do, can we partner? Because I have sites, may not necessarily have a lot of funding, but I want the sites to be protected, to be evaluated, to, so that as we move through our management of, of a particular landscape, we can make informed decisions. And then we can then take that information and turn it around and say, because of what they found, we can then go to another partner or to who our budget people are and say, we can address specific kinds of questions that are important to our agency or the management of that particular field station or refuge. If we're interested in doing uh, ecological reconstruction or, or restoration on a particular uh, 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 landscape or we're looking at particular you know is this particular species of animal present there we can use the information that we're getting from well thought out well done archaeological investigations to inform those and we give it a much greater time depth uh, in those kinds of, uh, of, of decisions so it's not like oh, we want to restore this wetland, and we don't, you know, we're restoring it as a, a red maple, you know, with red maple, and then when you ask wetland biologists, how did you do it? It was because it was the easiest thing to do. It has no real basis in fact. Archaeology is one of those ways you can give a real basis in fact of what that landscape looked like and how it had been managed over time, or evolved over time. Glenda Anderson. 
I have two questions for Dr. Kersey. Um, first of all, I'd like to know who your employer is um, and if you have staff who pays their salaries um, and how many of them there are. And then I'd like to know um, if your ordinance has any particular language that addresses archaeological artifacts that are found on public property, local public property or city county property. And if you do, do you have a designated repository for those things? And what is it, or who is it? That, that's a long question. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Uh, I, those are all really good questions. Right, uh, my employer is the city of Alexandria, and we have a department of history and an archeology span division. Uh, and that includes the city archives, that our department, as well as several museums that are operated by the city of Alexandria. Um, and my job title is actually city archeologist, which I really thought was cool when I, I Correct. This, this is not a state partnership. It's not a grant. We are paid just like engineers or planners or anybody else. Um, when I came, there was a staff of three, the city archaeologists and two archaeologists. And that number has increased uh, to add two part-time people, two 30-hour people, one of whom is an archaeologist and the other is an educator. So there are three full-time, two part-time people, and a 20-hour-a-week administrative assistant. We have over 100 of volunteers a year doing oral history, documentary history, digital archives, GIS, uh, excavation, laboratory, and we train them and supervise them. Um, and what else do I need to tell you? The yeah, organizational structure is city manager, deputy city managers, and then department heads. So uh, my boss is the director of the Office of Historic Alexandria. He is a department head. And then we are managers in the city in the senior management group as, uh, as I am as a division head, as are the other museums that are separate divisions. Um, and I think your other question was, what about city land? Um, correct. Good. And we are a little different. The city of Alexandria is simply a city. There are seven separate cities that aren't in counties in Virginia. We're one of them. Um, so we don't have an additional level of, of governmental structure. Um, our repository is a, um, a building that um, was actually used for, by the fire department for burn uh, tra training, putting out fires. <laughs> it's the old incinerator. And that's why I say again, look at adaptive reuse. Uh, somebody else is always looking for space, and they will probably have more money than we do. Public safety always gets more money. Schools always gets more money. But they're often rehabbing something or doing something and you can piggy tail, piggy tail? No, piggyback uh, with them. And so we have a collections room in the old incinerator, and that's where the city archives is too, very ironic. And um, we, uh, we secured a grant from the National Sci Science Foundation, NSF, uh, years ago when they actually created a grant for rehousing archeological mm -hmm. collections. Uh, that had been brought in by a certain year, which was the bulk of our collection. We used that money and presented it to the city to leverage, and they matched it in that particular case and gave us the space. That allowed us to put in complete temperature and humidity control, fire suppression, movable storage shelves, and to pay for people to completely rehouse the collection, which had been kept in an old World War I mosquito factory. Uh, in liquor boxes and bags and all the typical dumpster yeah. things that archaeologists get because the work had started by the Smithsonian back in the 1960s. And uh, this particular environment, not only was it very humid, but there were you know missing windows, there were snakes, birds. It, it was amazing. And so uh, that building was being rehabbed anyhow. 
So it was a movable thing. Well, the collection has to be moved. Was the collection valuable? Well, the, a lot of the collection had come out of urban renewal, and people had seen press releases on it and everything, and, and Ivor Noel Hume of Colonial Williamsburg has said, you know, best stuff he's found and ever seen in America, all this kind of thing. And so the collection then was something that we could present. The city of Alexandria owns this collection, and what are we going to do about it to secure it? And here's the money, and oh, all you need to do is put in X amount and give us space. So that allowed us to meet the new federal standards that had just been promulgated at that time as well. Um, we also have a museum because this torpedo factory has turned into an art center. And so it's been completely rehabbed. And there are 165 working artists, studios that you walk around in, in an art school with 7,000 students a year, um, at more continuing ed types of things than any degree, uh, and art galleries, and the building is used for weddings and bar mitzvahs, private parties. It's a really all-use building. We have a studio complex there, about 3,500 square feet, the Archeo Alexandria Archaeology Museum, and our interpretive theme is archaeologists at work. So that's our laboratory. So when you walk in, you see exhibitions, we're glassed in, but you can also physically walk in. That's where our lab is, um, artifacts, displays, but there's always an archaeologist there, except on Sundays, um, for asking questions or people to bring in artifacts or our repositories are open in terms of all our historical information. We have archived all the archaeology reports that have been done over time digitally. They're all online. And um, our, all our oral histories are online, as with the volunteers take the oral histories and transcribe them. So now we're working to get our photo collection online as well. So a repository are the artifacts, the reports, and, the report, and, and then the field notes that need to be copied on archival paper or now scanned and digitized so that the repository is all of the above, everything associated with the project. Sounds like we need a field trip. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's uh, give the mic to Alderwoman Mary Ellen Sprague. Wow. Um, this has been very important. I think I've taken five pages of notes. Um, <laughs> first of all, I want to speak for Eric Meyerhoff, who called me this morning, who really wanted to talk to Neil Dawson. Uh, but couldn't get a hold of him. Um, he wanted to relate two, two stories, and Eric Meyerhoff, for those of you who do not know, is a local architect who has been in Savannah many, many years. His first story was in 1967 when they were building the post office on Palm Street. They dug the foundations, um, and then they left for the weekend. A group of poachers showed up over the weekend and caused extensive damage causing a great deal of expense for the, the contractor. Uh, so not doing or not having an archaeological ordinance can actually hurt you anyway, uh, obviously, in that situation. The second story we had was a more positive story about when they did River Street and Rosakis Plaza in 1973. And in that situation, they brought in a um, arche arche archaeologist early on um, during the design phase. So while they were designing it, the archaeologist was doing digs. He did a dig every 100 feet um, and took samples and found nothing of a significance except a lot of toothbrushes and liquor bottles. But that <laughs> itself, I thought, was kind of yeah. interesting. Yep. Um, that it does go together. in a box at the housing authority. Uh, but that was a situation where it did not cost them anything because it was done during the, during the design phase. Um, so he is very much in favor of us tackling this as a community, and I think that's what he wanted to relate, for me to relate to all of you. Now, taking off Eric's hat, putting on my own hat, um, and this is again a, a question or comment on what Neil Dawson had to say about um, incentives. And an ordinance is kind of a negative thing, um, where incentives is a positive thing, and I want the developers and the contractors to want to find something. Um, so that we get the good stuff and it doesn't end up going home with, with the subcontractor or sent to China or, or whatever. Um, I think that um, uh, maybe ta tax incentives or some kind of something so that we can make it a positive thing would definitely be a step in the right direction. The other thing that I want to know was, and you alluded to the, 
um, Dr. Creasy a little bit about trying to get the poachers to bring their stuff in, um, kind of like an antiques roadshow for um, archaeological finds. But I know that there's tons of, of stuff that people have found in this city over the years that is being hidden in attics and wherever because, um, or they just have it, they don't know what to do with it. Um, is there any way to bring people, or has anybody thought about that? Like an amnesty program. Exactly. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to defer this one to Dan and Rita because I suspect they know more about what's going on around Savannah. Yes, we do that things like that. You know, we have public things and people bring artifacts in and we tell them what they are and how old they are and that sort of stuff. Um, routinely now specifically in Savannah I'm not so sure so uh, I'm gonna ask Dan this is Dan Elliott of Lamar Institute well, it's a problem. stand up Dan <laughs> testify stuff as everybody knows uh, stuff is a problem archaeologists have too much stuff we have to pay people to take our stuff uh, <laughs> yeah, people have collections of uh, these facilities they, uh, mentioned federally, left federal levels of acceptability standards. There's only uh, well, three or four places yeah. in Georgia that meet those standards. Um, and there, so there's really no place to put the stuff in if we get the stuff. So that's one problem. Um, the, other, the other problem is there's a fear of us taking their stuff. And that's a, that's a silly fear because we don't really want the stuff. We want the information <laughs> about the stuff. We want pictures of the stuff. We want to measure the stuff. But we don't, we we're overwhelmed as it is. So until there's a place in Georgia that was, uh, it's really got to come from the state level uh, of a museum of Georgia and archaeology or, or history and archaeology, uh, there's no place to put the stuff. And, uh, but we're interested in the stuff. We love the stuff. So uh, <laughs> it, it, it's a complex problem. We thought about it a lot, and we have made lately some great strides to, to connect with people and talking about stuff and sharing stuff. And finding out where the stuff, what we want to know is where the stuff came from, because that's, that's more important than the actual stuff. So the, uh, the interaction that we're having on recent projects with collectors and uh, landowners, you know, I, we're making some strides. The problem is there's just no place to put the stuff. We, they might want to give us the stuff. Uh, some collectors that have been metal detecting for 30 years are getting old, and they don't know where their stuff is going to go. And they don't want to put it on eBay. You know. So there's, we don't want to say it's going to leave that either. Um, and uh, it's a community problem, it's a state problem, it's a national problem. Um, I don't have a clue. It all boils down to stuff. <laughs> we are just about out of time. Does anybody have a, a burning question? Well, folks, let's have a round of applause for our panelists today. Thank you so much for coming. And uh, big thanks to all of you for taking time out on a beautiful Savannah Saturday. Uh, typical Savannah fashion, we have food and drink for you. So if you will follow, who are we following? You, Ellen, Kate? Follow these ladies. And panelists, y'all come on and eat. And please give them like two or three minutes to get a plate and a cup in their hand before you swarm them with more questions, okay? <laughs> Be hospitable.